welcome guys to the Pulse of Miami Church. And so since they're in our first service, a lot of times it's just our volunteer service, but we do have some new people here. So my name is Todd Peterson, and I'm the lead pastor here at this church. And I, I don't always wrap my hands when I come up and preach. This is going to be it's gonna be interesting for you. So you might be thinking, oh, this is normal. It's not normal at all. But we're going to be talking about something cool today. We, we've been, for the past four weeks, we've been talking about discipleship. Because this is not a series, guys. This is, this is the direction that I, as your pastor, I want to begin to lead our church into. And true discipleship, what I define as true discipleship is when we begin to get into face-to-face discipleship relationships. Kyle, you weren't here the week, uh, I don't know if anybody told on me, but like I had your picture up here with like Donnie and like how Donnie meets with you, you know, and you guys get to have those, that's the kind of face-to-face discipleship. They meet every single week, well, unless he's in Kentucky, right? But they meet every single week and they talk about scripture and they pray together. That's the kind of relationships that we need to be having with each other. But here's the truth. Look, a person who comes into the door is not going to walk in and be like, hey, is anybody going to do some face-to-face discipleship with me? No, there's a process, right? And here's the process. Here's how this whole thing works in our church, okay? The best thing to do, the best way to introduce this whole Jesus thing to somebody is just invite them to church, and that's the mouth of the funnel. The, the mouth of the funnel is our Sunday morning services. And then every single Monday morning service, here's what I promise. Whether I'm preaching or Wesley or whoever else is, is filling in for the pulpit. We are always going to preach from the word of God. Right? This is, you're never on a Sunday morning going to get a word of Todd. Right? Like, because if there's a word of Todd, it's really not worth a whole lot, right? But if it's a word from God, then it's actually valuable. And so, so here's what I can promise you. Every Sunday morning, we are going to bring a sermon from the word of God, and we are going to preach the gospel of Jesus, Jesus Christ. So if somebody comes here that doesn't know Jesus, we are going to give them an opportunity to be introduced to Jesus every, here on, every week on Sunday morning. Now, hopefully what ends up happening is that person begins to come to church regularly, that the sermons actually speak to, their, to their, their hearts. But after a while, a sermon's not going to be enough, and we need to invite them to a small group. And that's, that's what the middle part of the funnel is. And a small group, uh, for those of you who don't know, we meet in houses in, in our church, uh, you know, throughout Miami. And so some people meet at my house, and Carmen's house, and Maritza's, and, and so on and so forth. And, and if you'd like to volunteer your house sometime, you should let me know, because that, that would be a great thing. But... But you, you have people come over to your house or you go to somebody else's house. We eat together and we open up God's word together and, and we usually talk about whatever we learned in the sermon. How do we apply it to life? And our roots start to grow deeper when we're in small group. But what ends up happening in small group is we develop relationships with people. Kind of like Kyle and, and Donnie. And that is the face-to-face discipleship that we get to at the bottom. But uh, uh, unless people come to church, and unless people go to small group, they'll never gain that relationship with somebody that they can, they can have a face-to-face discipleship relationship with them. And so here's, here's what I want you to know. As a church, that's, that's what I'd like to see us do. But today, this is the last week that we're going to be talking about uh, discipleship until uh, before the holidays. So I want to talk to you about the one thing that could scare us all when it comes to face-to-face discipleship, and that is church conflicts. So the question that I think we need to ask, if we're going to get into each other's lives, how are we supposed to handle conflicts in the church? Which is why I've got, you know, my boxing wraps on, right? We're ready to go. How, how, How do you resolve conflicts in the church. Now, for some of us in here, you're like, what? There's conflicts in the church? I thought everybody was a believer in Jesus, right? But any of us who have spent any amount of time in church knows church conflicts just kind of comes with the territory, right? The truth of the matter is you get two human beings in a room for any length of time, and there's going to be a conflict. Whether they believe in Jesus or not, there's going to be a conflict, And so the question that I'd like for us to ask is how are we supposed to handle conflicts in the church? 
Are we supposed to just have those people just kind of hash it out and I, I don't want to hear about it? Like, you know, don't ruin my church experience because I know that there's a conflict going on in the church. Are we supposed to kick one of them out until they can learn their lesson and they come back? I mean, how are we, how are we as, as a church? Maybe we're not the ones who are in conflict. What, what is our role in this whole thing? Especially when we're in these face-to-face discipleship relationships. How are we supposed to handle conflicts in the church? And here's what I'm going to tell you. God has the biggest sense of humor ever. Because I was planning on preaching this sermon from weeks back. And then it's like last week, this huge conflict erupted in our church. There's, there's, and it has nothing to do with me. It's just two people who are upset with each other in our church. And I'm reading scripture and I'm just like, and I thought I knew how to resolve conflicts in church. And then all of a sudden God was like, hey, here's this verse that you never really thought about before. And it was like, boom. Then I'm like, God, if you're going to do this to me every time I'm going to talk about conflict, I'm never going to talk about conflict ever again, right? (laughs) But let's open up the word of God and see what he has to say about conflict. The, the, The first question that I want us to ask is, is there something wrong in a church that has conflict? Right? Is that, is that a, you know, in, an indicator that there's something wrong with the church because there's a conflict? Well, not necessarily. Because in Philippians, this is a letter that uh, Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. He loves the church in Philippi. He has nothing but great things to say about the church in Philippi. But check this out. Phil- Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. He says, now these two names are tough. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Sintichi to agree with each other in the Lord. I don't know, nobody knows what the conflict was about, but there's two women with these two weird names, Euodia and Sintichi. I'm probably butchering that. Probably over who's got the uglier name, right? They were probably fighting about that, whatever it was. I don't know. But they were fighting in the church. So here's, here's the first thing I want us to know. He loves the church in Philippi. There was nothing wrong with the church in Philippi. But church conflict needs to be expected. It's normal. And here are two godly women, and he's pleading with them, please agree with each other. But then I found fascinating verse 3. He says, yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow. In other words, I'm asking all the other people in the church, help these women. And that shocked me. I I thought that when people have conflict in the church, they need to resolve it. But this is what Paul has to say. No, the church is responsible to help them to resolve this issue. Yes, I ask you, uh, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended by my side in the, in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. <clears throat> you know, I've been in church for a long time and I've had different church conflicts and inevitably, especially, especially when people get really emotional, uh, there's always the kind of accusation. Somebody goes, you know what? I don't know if that person is even saved, right? They hurt me so much. <laughs> that laughs out of like, you've heard that before, right? I don't even know if they're saved. But here is Paul saying, no, both of these women, their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The truth is, is that conflict is normal. So if conflict is normal, then what are these women supposed to do about it? How is the church supposed to help them? Well, let's, let's look first at what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter 5. We actually read this uh, earlier this month when we were going through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said this in verse 23. He says, if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there, are, and, and there remember that your brother has something against you, verse 24. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift.
What we need to understand is the most important thing in a Jewish person's life at that time was the offering at the altar, right? Especially on the Day of Atonement. When, when we were supposed to be the one, when they were supposed to go and give an, off, an offering, they were giving an atonement for their sins for the whole year. It was the most important thing that a Jewish person could possibly do. And here's what Jesus has to say. If you're there and you're about to do the most important thing that a Jewish person is supposed to do, but while you're there, you realize that you've offended somebody, that your brother or sister is offended, leave the, the, the offering there. What is Jesus saying? You thought that was the most important thing, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to go and resolve the problem with your brother or sister in Christ. Man, that, that was shocking. And then he says something else pretty interesting in verse 25. He says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Now, um, apparently in scriptures, and this is what you're going to see today, that people, uh, scripture is not too big on going to court over things. In this, in this passage, it says, listen, on your way to court, try to resolve it. Try not to go to court with people. Now, the reason I'm putting on these gloves, and they are pink, because I just wanted you to dare make fun of me about it. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, these are my wife's. One of the things, I, I've, I, and I haven't shared this with too many people, but I, I used to be really into combat sports. So I, I did a lot of boxing, I did some karate, and I also did jujitsu. And uh, one of the things in every single, uh, <clears throat> didn't matter what discipline, your coach or your, your instructor would always tell you, when you're in the ring, don't leave it up to the judges, right? When you're in the ring, you go in there and you knock the person out. Or if you're doing jujitsu, you submit that person. Because if you leave it to the judge, you never know what's going to happen. You could totally be winning, but that judge gives it to the other guy. And if you've spent any amount of time watching combat sports, you'll, 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 you'll get the humor in this. Have you ever seen like a boxing match or a mixed martial arts where the guy just swears that he won, right? And at the end, there's a referee and he's going to hold up one hand or the other. And, and at the end, it's like, and the winner is. And he's putting his hand up and the ref's like, nope. <laughs> he holds the hand down and he puts up the other guy and the guy's like, what? Because you don't, you don't leave it up to the judge. Resolve your issue. And that's what, what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, listen, don't go to the judge because here's the deal. You never know what the judge is going to tell you. You may think you have a great case, but it's better to resolve your issue. If you want to have a conversation with a couple lawyers in our church, uh, Marlon would be one and Nicholas would be another one. They would tell you, man, if you, can, if you can resolve it outside of the court, you never know what's going to happen in court. And so the main thing that Jesus is saying is, if you've offended somebody, you need to fix it. But maybe you're sitting in here today in church and you're going, well, I'm not guilty of offending anybody. But somebody in this church is guilty of offending me. And so I'm going to wait until they come to me and fix this problem. But Jesus has something to say about those of us who have been hurt. Matthew chapter 18 verse 15 says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Like it is our responsibility. If you are hurting because of something that somebody else did, it is our responsibility to go and try to make it right. If your brother sins against you, and uh, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. You don't make it into a big deal. You just pull him aside and say, hey, look, you really hurt me about this. Or, you know what, we've got this issue that we need to resolve. Can we, can we fix it? And if he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Oh, man, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that to you. And then you end up, you know, what's, what's interesting is, is when we do things God's way, a lot of times the relationship becomes even stronger than it was before. 
How cool is that? Like, like I was offended. And then we got together and, and we worked it out. And, and now we're closer than, than we, we ever were before because we went through this thing together. But the question is, well, what if I go to them and they, they don't make it right? Verse 16. But if he will not listen... Take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. In Jewish law, you, you were so always supposed to have a witness. And what they were saying is, get some people who you both respect to come in and try to help you to resolve the issue. But what if they're stubborn? Verse 17. If he refuses to listen to even them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, if they're so rigid that after hurting somebody in the church, they don't care even when they're confronted by the person, by some godly people, and by the overall church, if they are still got a stiff back, then maybe they're not really saved. Put them out of the church. But then treat them like a tax collector or a pagan. Start witnessing to them, telling, telling them about Christ because they don't get it. So most of us, uh, if we've grown up in church, we've heard these two verses. But here's what I can almost guarantee you. You are not familiar with this last verse because I know I wasn't. I had read it before, but I had never really thought about it until this incident happened in the church and my first instinct was to step away these these people have to work it out but then in verse corinthians chapter 6 verse 1 paul is writing to the church in corinth and he says if any of you have a dispute with another dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints how dare you take your disputes before a, a secular judge instead of bringing it before the people of the church. Well, wait a minute. Paul, you, you want us to, if we have a problem, you don't want us to go to a judge? No. Verse 2, he says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Did you know that, guys? The saints, meaning the people who are believers in Jesus Christ, there's going to come a day where Jesus is going to sit in judgment over the entire earth. And he is going to enlist us to help him to make judgments between right and wrong. And so if we are qualified to be able to do that, and this is what Paul's argument is, are you not competent to judge these trivial cases? Like you're a child of God. You're going to be judging much bigger things than this. He goes on. This is shocking. Verse 3. Do you not know that we will judge the angels? You know, I think a lot of us, we have this conception of angels, that angels are better than us. But the truth of the matter is, the angels are the servants of God, and we are the children of God. And what Paul is saying is there is going to come a day where you and I, God is going to give us, he's going to give us the job of settling disputes in between angels. And so if we are qualified to settle disputes between angels, how much more the things of this life? And so here's the key verse. Verse 4. Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. Paul says... Account somebody who is, who is even of little account, you know, appoint them as a judge. Meaning, you know, the guy that you never want to listen to. You know, maybe the teenager that you don't think is wise enough. Now, why would he say that? Because he's making us feel bad, or, or the people in Corinth feel bad. Verse 5, he says, I say this to shame you. I say this to shame you. Because is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? I started thinking to myself, if I had a conflict with somebody, maybe it even involved money in the church, 
And we needed to resolve it. Do, do, would I really want to go to the court? Or would I trust somebody in our church like Marlon Moffat, who's a godly man and who's, who's also a lawyer professionally and has been given op- multiple offers to become a, a, a uh, judge? Man, I, I think I would rather, I think I would trust his judgment over some judge that I've never met before. Why not submit myself to whatever he has to say? And get the other person in the church to say, hey, listen, whatever Marlon says, that's what we're going to do. Isn't that a better approach to solving problems than going to a court? Verse 6, but instead, he says, one brother goes to law against another. And this in front of unbelievers. You know what the problem is? Is that when we, when we go to court against each other, unbelievers are looking at this and going, I thought they were supposed to be different. I, I thought that when they had Christ, that they had peace. These people definitely don't have peace. So in ver- verse 7, he says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Wow. If we were to have somebody from this church have a lawsuit against somebody else from this church, the church is defeated. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Paul says, wouldn't it be better just to be wronged, to be cheated, and just kind of move on with life? Rather than having the church be completely defeated in the face of all of these unbelievers? And so in verse 8, he says, instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. It's not right. And so from these verses, uh, you know, I'm just trying to understand, how are we supposed to handle conflicts in the church? And what I've seen is, is that we all have a responsibility to help, church so- help solve church conflicts. Whether we're the person that did something wrong, if we're the person that did something wrong, we have the responsibility to try to make it right. On the other hand, if if we're the person who was wronged, if we're the person who's offended, we also have the responsibility to try to make it right. And if the two of them need help, and they come up to you and say, hey, can you help me with this? The proper response is not, hey, you guys need to figure this out for yourselves. The proper response is, yeah, I love you guys, and I want to help. And finally, for the rest of us as a church, for those of us who are not intimately involved in it, we should be praying for the people in our church who are having conflicts. If you're aware of a conflict going on in a church, the very least that you can do is to commit time to praying through that. See, I I think what ends up happening is um, we get uncomfortable with things like conflict This is why most churches, people don't want to know each other. They don't want to do business with each other. They don't want to be in each other's houses. You know why? Because they know that if there's a conflict, then it's going to become a problem. And it makes me uncomfortable. But did you ever think, did you ever think maybe for a second that that's how God changes our lives? When things aren't comfortable? That maybe, that maybe God would use conflicts inside of the church Not only to grow you, but also to grow other people. That maybe by other people praying and being a part of it and and people trying to mediate and being in between, that God would grow all of us in our faith through that. You see what I'm saying? That's what it means to be a church family. We are all responsible to help solve these church conflicts. We shouldn't shy away from them. But so many churches, they're like, you know what? We're so afraid of it, we would rather not even do the face-to-face discipleship thing. I'm just going to show up on Sunday, and, and that's it. I'm telling you that we're missing out. One of the greatest ways, the greatest things I've ever seen is God solve a problem in a church, and everybody grew deeper in their faith. So here's, here's what I'm going to ask you guys to do. For those of you who are part of this church, I'm not at liberty to tell you guys uh, the two people who are having a conflict in our church. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask 
that you pray for them. Just pray for them. And I'm kind of in between. I'm doing the mediator thing. I'm actually, I'm kind of the guy that's in between the whole thing. And at first, you know, everybody was saying, you know, there was people that were like, Todd, you know, this is their problem. This is not your problem. The more that I read scripture, I said, man, I I can't stay away from this. I love this person and I love that person. And it's my responsibility to do everything that I can to help. So I'm going to ask you guys, at the very least, could you spend a little bit of time in prayer, praying for, for a conflict that's in our church? And maybe you're here today, and maybe you're not part of our church. Perhaps this is your first time. Maybe, maybe you're a believer in Jesus. Maybe you're not. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to address the biggest conflict that you have in your life right now. It's the conflict between you and God. Because the Bible says that sin separates us from God. Our imperfections separate us from God. But Jesus was willing to be the mediator between us and the God the Father. Jesus was even willing to lay down his life to resolve the conflict between us and God. And in a minute, if you'd like Jesus to change your life, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand when everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. But if it was that important to Jesus that he would lay down his life to resolve a conflict between us and God, then we are all responsible to solve church conflicts. Let me have everyone bow your heads and close your eyes, nobody looking around. If you're here today and you're confused about this whole God thing, I want to help you to resolve the conflict between you and God. Maybe you're like, man, I haven't done anything to God. Now let me explain. God is perfect and God is holy. But you and I, we are not perfect and we are not holy. And our imperfection and our unholiness is what the Bible calls sin. And sin separates us from God. Because our sin violates the very nature of who God is. We have disrespected God with the way that we've lived our lives. It's not about comparing ourselves with other people. It's, it's about comparing ourselves with the holiness of God and we all fall short. So we are hopelessly separated from God. There is nothing that we can do to fix the relationship between us and God. There's no amount of church attendance. There's no amount of money that we can give. There's no amount of good things that we can do that will fix the conflict between us and God. But if you've missed out on everything else I've said here today, do not miss out on these next few words. But God loves you anyway. You say, but Todd, how how do you know that he loves me? You don't even know the things that I've done in my life. And you're right, I don't. But I know what God did for you and for me. He sent his only precious child to die for us. And at You may have people in this life who love you, but I can guarantee you this. There is nobody in this life who loves you enough to allow their precious child to die for you. That is the unbelievable and unmistakable love of God. The story goes that God the Father sent his son Jesus from heaven to earth. That Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I are not capable of living. But at the end of his life, instead of just going back up into heaven, which is what Jesus deserved to do, he laid down his life on a cross. He allowed himself to be executed like murderers were executed even though he was completely innocent. Why did he do that? So that no matter what you and I have done in this life, when we believe in Jesus, our sins are placed on him. And his righteousness, his right relationship with God is placed on us. And through Jesus, we receive peace between us and God. The best part of the story is that when the only precious child of God places his identity on you, he gives you the right to become a precious child of God yourself. So maybe you're here today. Maybe you're realizing, I I need to say yes to Jesus. I'm I'm in conflict with God, and and I I don't want to be in conflict with God anymore. I want to become a child of God. 
If that's you here today, I want to give you an opportunity just in a moment. And this is why every head is bowed and every eye is closed. But in a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. I'm only going to pray with you. And I just would like to know who I'm praying with. And so if you would like to become a child of God, if you would like to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to end the conflict between you and God, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand right now. Amen. Either everybody in here is a believer or perhaps there's some people who are still working on that decision. Here's my promise to you. If you bring somebody here to church, we will share the gospel of Jesus Christ every week. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I, I pray for our church. I pray for the people who are in conflict right now in our church, Lord, and Lord, remind us that when things get painful, you're actually trying to teach us something. Lord, that these things don't take you by surprise. And Lord, that, that you take the painful things of life and you teach us some deep and truths that, that are supposed to change our lives and, and the way that we live. Lord, help us to not go through painful situations and waste them and to live our lives the same way that we did before, Lord. I pray that every single painful trip experience that we have, Lord, would change us and we would become more like you. Lord, I pray for that with this current conflict. Lord, I pray for everybody that's involved, Lord, and pray that you would bring us all closer to you because of it. Lord, for the rest of us, I, I just pray that we would be convinced at this point from here forward, Lord, that, that we would be concerned about church conflict that we would pray for people, that we would be involved when we need to be involved. Lord, I pray that you would break our hearts if we need to do something differently, if we've offended somebody. Lord, I pray that you would convict our hearts, help us to approach people with humility. Lord, there's so much that we're supposed to learn about the scriptures simply because you called us to resolve church conflict. Lord, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.